Rockefeller International Chairman Rashir Sharma joins us now. Rashir, you don't think they're going to try to stimulate their way out of this? Well, I think they're playing this uh, game, you know, which is a bit of a charade that they keep telling us that they're growing at 5%. And if they're growing at 5%, then the obvious answer is why stimulate? Why do anything um, if the economy is really growing at 5%? Now, we as investors know that's not the truth. If you look at the revenues of companies, look at the profits of companies and the other problems of the property market, you know that the economy is not growing at 5%. But as long as they keep on with this charade that we're growing at 5%, there's no need to really stimulate, right? Well, I guess the, the question comes back to their desire to overtake the United States and to become the global reserve currency. And it was always thought that they were just going to do anything they could to get there. Exactly. But I think that they have a major constraint there, which is that if they try and stimulate just now, they're likely to see a big depreciation in the currency because interest rates in China are way below the interest rates in the United States. So that's one reason also that they're not stimulating because they do not want to see a sharp depreciation in their currency. They really want to be the world's largest economy in nominal dollar terms. They were on that path where they got to more than 70% the size of US GDP. Now for the last couple of years, they've been falling back and the exchange rate depreciation has been one factor behind that. So they don't want a weaker exchange rate, even if it's the right policy solution to try and stimulate the economy. So you're not you're not at, you're not allocating money toward China. You're not buying there, even though a lot of people think it looks cheap after last year. Yeah, I mean it's a very big market. It's still the world's second largest stock market. So there'll be some opportunities that uh, we'll get. But we have typically been halfway China for a long period of time, uh, just because its size is so big. But this whole idea that the that they're going to stimulate and the market's going to revive itself. I think the problems are much deeper, which is that the Chinese economy faces a lot of headwinds from demographics to debt, uh, and also the fact that uh, Xi Jinping doesn't really believe in a free market economy. Uh, he has a much more status mindset. And so what his incentive is and what he thinks is the right outcome is very different than what investors think. So the entire market today is trading like a state-owned enterprise. The private sector companies are getting derated and their valuations are converging with the state-owned companies. So that's the really big shift in China, which is happening. The whole market is trading like one big state-owned enterprise. Hmm. Rashir, great piece in the FT looking at trends for 2024. Uh, you talk about China in that piece, and you actually talk a lot about European resilience. And I'm wondering how you square that, given their reliance on China trade. Yeah, I think Europe might point is this, which is that they've gone through so many disasters over the last 10, 12 years that it's really the new hopeless continent. That, that was a derogatory term being used for Africa at one point in time. Today, you could use it for Europe, that everyone is very pessimistic on Europe. And my sort of response is that Europe may not shine or uh, do really well, but it could be much more resilient than what people think, uh, just because Firstly, the Europeans have saved a lot of their stimulus out of caution compared to, let's say, in America, where a lot of the stimulus has gotten uh, spent by the consumer. Plus, in Europe, a lot of the debt is on floating rate compared to America, where a lot of the debt was taken at, at fixed rates. So in a way, Europe has already suffered the shock of higher interest rates in a way that America so far hasn't. And also the fact that the energy shock is receding much faster because they had a much bigger energy shock to deal with. So wages in Europe are beginning to uh, grow for the first time uh, in a meaningful way after adjusting for inflation. So those are some tailwinds, I think, in favor of Europe. And it's quite interesting that even if you look at 2023, the average European stock, in fact, uh, did better than the average American stock. But it's just that in America, the performance was so flattered by the Magnificent Seven, as we all know uh, by now. So I think even the market is beginning to sense something there. So yeah, simple point about Europe is deep amount of pessimism. On my list at this time last year, I had a Japanese comeback as one of my top 10 surprises. I think for this year, if I was to pick a surprise, it's that Europe ends up being more resilient, not necessarily a star, but more resilient given how pessimistic expectations are.